I am here at Fully Charged Live in San Diego, and I am here with Jeremy Whaling from EVGo. He is a senior EVSE engineer, and we talked to him back at CES in 2020. And we've dragged him onto the floor here to chat with us. The ball and chain. Ball and chain, because <laughs> we have been talking about the reliability of EVSE units, the large rapid chargers that you see out there. What we're going to talk about today is some general stuff about EVSEs, and we're going to dig into why those chargers have had these reliability issues and how those are being addressed as we go forward. Jeremy, thank you so much for talking to yes, us today. of course. So I think the first thing that we should ask is that Tesla charger rollout. You did have a rollout of some Tesla charging units yes. or Tesla charging connectors on your units. Yes. How has that gone for you? It's gone pretty good. Um, we, I believe we have about 400 in the market right now, and we have a couple more still to go, but we've rolled out basically all that we'll be rolling out for now. It's, do, it's doing well. It's certainly, for us, we, we are looking at utilization and the amount of drivers we have going to our stations that are, you know, clearly Tesla drivers and stuff, and we, we're definitely seeing an uptake of, of uh, Tesla usage on our network, so it's great. <laughs> Did you, do you know anything about whether those units were positioned in areas where there weren't that many superchargers, or was that not part of the factor? That... One of our biggest things was actually cable reach. So being able to make sure that the Tesla drivers could actually plug in in a way that like, they're not gonna end up blocking a weird spot or it wasn't gonna make exact sense for you know, the way that that site layout was. Because some of our sites, you know, like just the number of parking spaces and how that all works out, we would hate to install something and then you couldn't physically use it. That, that's a good way to increase your blood pressure really quickly. So we're like, uh, okay, so we started with that. And then we also looked at the different markets that made sense that we went, okay, this market has enough, you know, Teslas, of course, Teslas are everywhere. So it's already a pretty high usage, but we, we looked at sites where we thought, okay, it's gonna be worth it. There's gonna be Tesla usage here. There's a lot of drivers in that area and stuff like that. So I think it, the Tesla network as well kind of played a bit of a role. Um, I will be honest, I wasn't the person that said it goes there or there. Yeah. I worked on other parts of it, but in general, that's kind of the overall gist of what, what we did. Did you have any issues with connectivity, with getting making sure that Teslas were able to work when they pulled uh, up and charged, no. or did that go fairly smoothly for you? Fairly smooth, smoothly overall. Um, one of the things, though, is the, uh, the Tesla Plaid um, uses a higher pack voltage, and so we did see some issues with that when that vehicle came out. Um, fortunately, we were able to get an update to those adapters, and they they all work now. So they're all they're with those cars. So before it would it would hit a voltage limit, and then basically it would stop charging earlier than customers expected. And so we got it out there, and that that's all rolled out now. So so some people have said to us, should we adopt the Tesla charging connector across the U.S. as the standard? Yes, a million dollar question. One of our one of our concerns with that kind of rollout is that what you see with Tesla's superchargers is that the manufacturer has control of the chargers and the cars. Yes. And so they know exactly... And the exactly, connectors on both sides. Yeah. They know exactly <laughs> how that standard is yes. going to be implemented. Yes. If that were to happen, if we were to switch to Tesla chargers, would you expect to see the same kind of connectivity issues we've seen with other cars in the past? So you've got the Tesla connector and you've got Tesla vehicles, but you also have... All the vehicles on the market today, I mean, in the U.S. market, we have three connectors for DC fast charging, essentially, right? And the idea is to eliminate standards to get to one, I think is the ultimate goal. Yeah. And there is no denying that the Tesla connector is svelte. It is nice. It's easy to plug in. I'm a Model 3 driver, a Model Y driver, owner. Uh, so it works very well. Um, but there are some thoughts that it might not work for high voltage. Um, there's also that, yeah, Tesla is in complete control of it. And just, you have a lot of vehicles in the market with, with not the Tesla connector that are not Teslas. And I think increasingly more, like the market itself is growing. And, you know, for one automaker to sort of dominate a particular segment is actually like not a good thing. Like we need to have many options in the market. So we need to have you know, lots of different vehicles, and those vehicles right now are CCS. Like, everything coming out is CCS all across the board. So, um, we'll see. Yeah. And Elon's, you know, he can tweet and things can happen, so I... <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, he definitely... I, people act on what he says, yes, that's for sure. Yes, but I, I think... I Personally, I, I don't know. I don't see it quite 
going that way, but... No, we'll I mean, I, I just think it's an interesting question. Yeah. People assume that the Tesla experience would translate, that and they would get an i3. The connector or, well, is certainly a portion of it. Yeah. But it's not all of it. No. Uh, part mm -hmm. of it is, I mean, they truly, they have control over, you know, the supercharger network does not use the same protocol as CCS. The single wire can interface, it's very too much tuned for their stuff, but um, that standard's not available, and... You know, CCS is what it is. It's a, it's a complex standard, and there can be many pitfalls of it. Interoperability is like a whole subject we can talk about later about cars and making sure they actually charge with different compatibility problems. But so the connector doesn't solve those things, and those are uh, a chunk of the issues we've seen, you know, with EV charging today. So um, I mean, it would it'd be nice in some ways, but I don't think it's not gonna it's not a silver bullet. It's not gonna solve everything. No. Even if it were to happen yeah. overnight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully not overnight, because then yeah. I can't charge oh, no, my car. Be, that would be very <laughs> sad. That would be very sad. Okay, so I think the, the big question that our viewers want to know about, and I can tell you're oh, just yeah. dying to answer this. <laughs> so there have been a lot of concerns about the reliability of the CCS charging units. Yes. Um, something that we've seen from multiple suppliers yes. on the way down here. We've seen multiple units out of action, particularly hot weather, yes. finding them derating, so yes. limiting their charging speed. Yes. Um, can you talk us through why those things might be happening? Yes. Um, so to start, part of it is if it's derating, something is either at a high temperature and you can't effectively go run it at the normal high current that you would want to do, or there's a failure of a sensor, a temperature sensor, in the system somewhere. And we do know some of the early liquid-cooled cables that are in the market today have problems that were resolved with a newer generation. And when we went to go put liquid cooling out in mass, we went with the newer generation because just by the fact that having we're buying after the fact that others have bought a lot of the older generation, we can just go ahead and start with the new, but also just we do a lot of cable qualification testing at our lab and that was one thing we were like, we absolutely must make sure that these temperature sensors within the cable are good and don't have this flaw in them. So, um, and we haven't seen exactly the same problems that other networks have seen in terms yeah. of that sort of derating, I think. But that's, in general, that's what you're seeing. If you're seeing it derating, something's unhappy about usually temperature or the cooling system in general. Um, what's, what's actually happening is that the system is derating to 100 amps. So it's 100 amps times your pack voltage. So, you know, for a low voltage vehicle, you know, Mach-E or the uh, Ford F-150 Lightning, 350, 400 volt range, 35 to 40 kilowatts. And that's... The and that is painful to fill oh, a 131 kilowatt hour very, battery at 33 oh, yeah. kilowatts. It's, no, that's, it's, it's tough. And the system as well, what we've started doing too is going, okay, well, derating is really bad. Um, let's get as much data as we can out of the charger. Mm -hmm. So that way we can see if we start to see problems, because sometimes these things will, will start to happen. They won't be like a permanent derate where it'll lock out. It'll actually just drop down for a bit and come back up. And for that, we're like, okay, that's easier for us to check with data, but harder for a driver to see. So we can get it a little bit sooner. Because like if, if a customer is actually calling and saying, hey, the charger's derated, in some ways we've already sort of failed. We should be getting the data, as much data as we can out of the charger to, to know when things are, you know, not good or look like they might not get good. Something like, you know, yeah. non-scientific terms, right? Yeah. We're actually working on getting a lot of data out of the charger. Um, that's not part of the normal communication standards. And what we've also been doing is working with our suppliers to go, okay, if you have derating that you need to do, like, let's be smart about it. Because some, some uh, manufacturers, they put in a default for their derating that is just really aggressive. Yeah. And we're like, you don't, we don't need to be that aggressive on it. You, you're still completely safe. Both, you know, aggressive, non-aggressive, like you're still well within the safety margins, but like they're just, they're dropping down current way quickly. And then like, yeah, you'll get cooling. The cool, you know, it'll go down and then it'll, you could jump back up. And it's like, you'll see this going back and forth and you're like, this is like, what's it doing? And yeah. you could have some problems. So we're working, um, in our lab on basically 
modeling the thermal properties, working on better control algorithms for the cooling systems overall. So, and working with suppliers that allow us to do that, <laughs> to be to be that ingrained into the product, really. So, yeah. yeah. I was talking with an engineer from another charging provider uh -huh. who will re remain unnamed. Sure. And he was mentioning that they have struggled with getting diagnostic information out of the charging. Yes. Like they buy a charger and there is an expectation that they will get diagnostic information. Yes. But the diagnostic information they get is insufficient to repair yes. the charger successfully. Yes. At least insufficient to do it in one go. It's sort yes. of bring me a rock. Yes. This bit might be broken, turn yeah. up, yeah. wait for the parts, turn up, replace yeah. them. Oh no, no, it's yeah. actually this bit. It's it's such a bad I mean, that's part of like the repairability side of things is just if you actually have a, you know, you have a vague understanding, you send a tech out just to kind of be get a better idea, he finds out there's a part that it needs, you send a tech back out, oh wait, it's actually not the right part. Like, these technician truck rolls are not like, oh, well he comes back in an hour with the part in hand. Like, it's sometimes, depending upon what it is, if it's like the, the, um, the heat exchanger for the charger, for the dispenser, like, it's a, you know, it's a big box, and like, it takes, it does not, move instantly from warehouse to site. So, you know, getting the information earlier just to be like, okay, we, we're going to the site and we know exactly what part failed, like that's, you know, super much more better for us and for customers because we can turn around and repair these things much faster. So, yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't know exactly who that was, but I feel their pain and that's why we're just, we're so aggressive about this with our suppliers right now. Yeah. And, you know, is that something you're seeing in, sometimes? <laughs> is that something you're seeing improving the the diagnostic information yes. you're getting? Yes. Yeah, we've worked a lot with the vendors on. Our, we have like a, a vendor air code project where we're getting as much data, improving our air codes, uh, recreating the air codes in our lab, making sure that like, hey, when you say it's that air code, it's truly that air code and this problem. That's you know, it's matching one to one yeah. because uh, you know it. We, it turns out you really need to be diligent about testing all this. And yeah. I mean, all the major networks, they have labs, so they're doing the same thing. I may not talk about it that much, but that's basically, you know, everybody's kind of working on this, I think, in the industry because we need it. And yeah. that's a big area of like improvement that we can do in the short term. Yeah. And I know we talked about this a little bit off camera yesterday, yeah. but um, can you give us the one thing that people always ask us for? Canopies. Can you give me an idea about why it's such a struggle to I get love, canopies? I do. Part, I, I internally, I bug people too. I love canopies. They, they're nice. Um, shading is important. We see this gas stations, right? Gas stations have shading. The problem becomes if you put stuff in the air, it's a civil engineering project in its own right. And it depends upon the site host and stuff. We might have problems with the site host not wanting canopies the site host only wanting to have a certain number of spaces and the spaces that we would need to put the anchors for the canopies and stuff start to take into their spaces. Um, different things like that that just have limited, but for sure that's something we're looking at. Yeah, yeah. it's it, it benefits everybody. So I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit. What is the thing you most wanna see change with EV charging? I think the, uh, I wanna see good charge curves. So we, we, and we're seeing them somewhat, but I think we're, we're so close to having some really good charging curves where people can, I talked about this on my panel yesterday, which was like, we're kind of close to actually being able to, if you wanted to, only relying on public charging with a couple of caveats and think, you know, like it's, it's still like, you have to be in an area served properly with the number of stations. But one of them is, is actually like the charge curves. Cause like when we put in a 350 kilowatt charger, Today, very few vehicles that can do it. There's like basically two or three. And there's a lot more than that in the market. But, and so that's future proofing. So that way we can actually serve those vehicles in the future that actually will take 350. Um, but in general, we've also seen, well, some vehicles, they start out very fast and then they, they go down really quickly as well. And I want to see more of that just overall in general. And I think the newest stuff coming out and out now is like, yeah, that's, it's a, the many automakers are already kind of like driving towards that. They want to see it too. The other one is of course, like, you know, improved reliability and, and connectivity. Um, and AVGO, we are working heavily, me personally, I'm working heavily on improving connectivity of our chargers. Um, and that's, that's another pain point that people have brought up too, is where the chargers, they're not just derated, they're completely offline. And for whatever reason, you can't get a charge to start. That's a big area of our testing right now. Um, we're working a lot on, on in actual cell, cellular antennas and like seeing like, okay, which cellular antennas actually will give us better improvements 
Um, it turns out that, and this has affected more than just like us, like industry, but even just like the IoT industry as a whole, the shutdown of 3G and moving to 4G has exposed like, hey, we need to improve our 4G connectivity to the stations. And it turns out that a lot of it is the antenna um, yeah. and improving our antennas. Um, and this is, you know, a lot, a lot of other industries have found this too. Yeah. So, um, yeah, improving reliability and, and on, on that front, I think is really important. And I, the other two is, is um, you know, the, the plug-in charge or the seamless being able to just plug in and start charging. Like that's, we're doing that right now with GM and, and um, you know, we've got some stuff in the works for, for, for others in general and all that good stuff. So um, we've gotten amazing responses so far on, on the GM uh, plug-in charge system and we will continue to uh, refine and, and make that, that great. But it's, it's so nice just to be able to plug in your vehicle. Yeah. So I don't know if the Ford, you should be able to do plug and charge yeah, on it does do the plug other and network. Charge on, yes, on certain chargers. On certain chargers, yes. Yeah, well, I mean, sort of doesn't for the customers. Like, it doesn't matter how the the, the back end sort of does it. It just does it, right? Yeah. Consistently, quickly, all that good stuff. It's really nice because then you it, you don't need to interact with the charger as much. You just kind of plug it in. It kind of shows you on the screen that it's starting, and then it's good. Like, yeah. it psychologically, it makes a big difference. I've been personally testing that a lot, and um, oh, it's just so nice. It's just such a good feeling. So, and we've seen that in our, our customer surveys. It's like, yeah, they're all really happy about it. So I'm like, good, Lord, I want to do more of that. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've had a few experiences with plug and charge. Obviously, I have a Nero, which does not plug and charge, sadly, yeah. um, unless you're in Europe, and there is a particular network in Europe where you yes. can set it up yes. to recognize your car specifically even though it doesn't officially do plug and charge right is that something you would consider looking at for those drivers of like things like the bolts or the well the bolts you should be able to do it through the gm but okay. other other automakers um I'll just say watch the space okay <laughs> okay yes <laughs> you heard it here first oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much yes. it's always a pleasure to talk to you yes and thank you for putting up with us asking the kind of questions oh, that sure. a lot of other people are not willing to talk to us about yet yes of course so, thank you so much for watching and we are here at fully charged live so well no teleprompter just the phone but that is it for today if you enjoyed the video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and sharing it with your friends. And don't forget to leave your thoughts below or in our Discord chat room. There is a link down in the description. And if you really liked it, why not give us a super thanks? It's easy to do and everything you send goes towards helping us make great content and come to places like this and talk to people like Jeremy, who is very lovely. If you haven't yet, please consider subscribing to our channel and our other channel, our little kind of background channel where we do some behind the scenes stuff, that is Transport Evolve Take 2, and give the bell a gentle ring to make sure you're told when our next video goes live. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew, go out to everyone who makes TE possible. That includes everyone who supports us on Patreon and on YouTube, as well as those of you who just watch the video and share it. If you're a supporter at the charged up level, you'll see your name right here on my right. And if you just joined, we're sorry if your name isn't on the list. As you can see, we are at Fully Charged Live and not rendered the list out this week. So it will be up there soon, I promise. Sometimes our videos are also produced a couple of weeks in advance. So those you might have to wait on. Thanks to our self-driving tier supporters. That's Chris Maxwell, Pedro Muro Pinheiro, Patrick Boyarski, Bennett Elder, Brian Newton, Dave Kitchen, Michael Goad, Ricky Leong, Andrew Martin, Guido Drahota, Brophy Wolf, Tezza in the Gong, Gordon C, Stephen O'Donoghue, Kyle Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Raging Fellows, Dan Blair, Jim Burness, Chris Ascenter, Chris and Michael Johnson, Peter Dillinger, and Denny Hyde. And of course, out of this world, thanks to our Starman supporters, Anonymous Freak, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, Rory Litwin, Joe Bresney, Reed R, JP Fagerback, Russ, Will Graylin, Matthew Drobnak, Kevin Burbridge, John Lyons, Andrew Glenn, Paul Conway, Laura Reynolds, and of course, Ian. Want to be part of that amazing list? You can join Patreon at the link below, hit the join button below to support us on YouTube, or show us your support through Bitcoin, Kofi, or our cool swag store. Links are all down there. And if you're unable to support us financially, just know that watching the video and sharing it really makes a difference to our ad revenue. Thanks for joining me. And as always, keep evolving.